this morning. Take your Bible today, if you would, to go to Isaiah chapter 46. And I'll do it to you again, Brother Dean. I'm going to add verse 9 to this, okay? So sometimes I give them the verses we're going to read, and then I add something to it. And so I'll, I won't let them down again. I'll do it again. We're going to read verses verse 9, 10, and 11. Let's read 9 together. I'll read 10, and we'll end together by reading verse number 11. And verse 11 is going to be our text verse this morning, all right? As our custom is, let's stand together, and we'll read Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11. Reading 9 together, I'll read 10, and we'll end in verse 11 together. Verse 9 together, ready? Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Let's pray, shall we? Father, Add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Lord, I pray that you will continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth that you have for us today. Thank you already for what we've heard, for what we've been able to sing. Lord, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord today. And Father, I'm asking you to help us now and, and use the special to continue to, to make our hearts ready, to put us in tune with you, to put away from our minds and out of our minds thoughts that would capture our attention and keep us from hearing what you would want to say to each of us this morning so lord uh, f- help us to focus and and i pray that our hearts would be good ground that the word of god can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives and i pray it in jesus name amen Listen to the sound of the ocean crashing with the rhythm of praise. Listen to their song of devotion dancing with the sun's golden rays. Listen to the music of nature floating from the birds of the sky singing their song to the maker lifting his praises on high the heavens declare the glory of god all nature is singing his majesty the love creation is filled with his honor glory and praise listen to the song of the sunrise listen to the voice of the light watch as the moon gives the signal starting the music to the song of creation listen to the language of praise filling the earth and the heavens praising the ancient of days the heavens declare the glory of God all nature is
Now, our Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. <clears throat> Again, Lord, thank you for what you've already done here this morning. It's been a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. And Father, we have enjoyed the music and the fellowship together and the giving of the tithe and the offering, but Lord, it just wouldn't be fulfilling. We wouldn't uh, have all we need if we didn't hear from your word this morning. And so, Father, I pray you'll help me as I bring the message today. Lord, I pray that it'll be clear, it'll be concise, it'll be used by you in the hearts of the people that are here this morning. May we understand just who you are and what you desire in our life that we might be pleasing to you. And so, Father, uh, please help each individual as they listen today in Spirit of God do in our hearts what only you can do. Bless these next few moments we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 46, if your Bible's open there, if you would please. You know, there's nobody like God. And God reiterates that over and over again in, through the New Testament to Israel, that there's no one like me. But what I want to point out to you today is, whatever God sets out to do, God does. You ever notice that? Whatever God sets out to do, He will do. We can set out to do something, and then at times we're unable to do it. You ever set out to do something, and then you had to call someone and apologize and say, I'm sorry, I'm unable to do what I thought I would be going to be able to do? You know, God never has to say, I'm sorry, I'm unable to do that. God, God never says, hey, you know what? I fully intended to, but I'm a little short this month. God never says that. God never says, you know, I really meant to, but I just ran out of time. God never has to be concerned with that. God never says, well, something came up. Or it's quiet in here, isn't it? In other words, what God's saying is, what He purposes, He will do. Whatever He purposes, He does it. He purposed creation, and He did it. He purposed mankind, and He did it. He purposed to choose Israel as His people, and He did it. He purposed to deliver them out of Egypt, and He did it. He purposed to part the Red Sea, and He did it. He purposed to drown the Egyptian army in the Red Sea, and He did that. Uh, he purposed to give them a king, and He did it. He purposed to give them prophets, and He did it. He purposed to give mankind a Savior, and He did it. He purposed to provide us with redemption and salvation, and He did it. He purposed to provide us with His Word, and He did it. And everything that God purposes to do, He does. And He does that for you and for me. Notice what He said in verse 11. I, very end of the verse, I have purposed it, I will also do it. Now, <clears throat> that's God. Now let us bring it to you and me. You'll never do what you ought to do until you first purpose to do it. You'll never do what you ought to do until you first purpose to do it. In fact, that's how you got saved. If you know Christ as your Savior here this morning, uh, at some point in your life, somebody told you the gospel. Whether you heard it uh, on the internet, <laughs> whether you heard it by somebody telling you, whether you read it in the scriptures, whether, but somehow you, you, you understood that you were a sinner who needed to be saved, that you were on your way to hell, and that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for your sin debt. And that, that He was buried, He rose again the third day, and that now He's able to save all those who come unto God by Him. And that if you'll call on Jesus and trust what He's done for you, and trust Him alone as your Savior, He'll give you the gift of eternal life, and you can be saved. And you know what you did? You purposed in your heart, and you said, I'm going to do that. And you bowed your head, or you fell on your knees, whatever it may be, but you called on the Lord, and you asked Him to be your Savior. But before you ever did it, you purposed in your heart to do it. I think that's why the Bible says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Uh, you have to believe in your heart that God hath raised you from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. The belief and the purpose in your heart. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about purpose of heart. Purpose of heart. 
Number one, I want you to purpose in your heart to live for God. You know, many people never live for God because they never purposed in their heart to live for God. They just uh, take life as it comes. Uh, look at Acts chapter 11. Go to the New Testament with me, if you would, please, to the book of Acts and chapter number 11. Acts 11, the persecution has come uh, under, led by, by, by Saul, and the church is scattered, which is what they should have done in the first place. And notice with me in verse 19 of Acts chapter 11. They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of the men, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Well, tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which is in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Now watch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart. With what? Say it one more time. Purpose of, purpose of heart. They would cleave unto the Lord. Brand new Christians. Just got saved. Just heard the gospel. Believed in the Lord Jesus. Barnabas comes down. And you know what he says? You got to serve. You Listen, you need to cleave to the Lord with purpose of heart. You have to purpose in your heart that you're going to live for God. The word cleave there is, a, is very similar to the word glued. You got to be glued to the Lord. It's kind of like super glue. You know, you, you know what? You're as close to the Lord this morning as you purpose to be. You are as close to God as you want to be. If you don't feel close to God, it is not the problem is not on God's side. The problem is always on your side. And, and, and you can be as close to Him as you purpose to be. In fact, you're as good a Christian as you purpose to be. The reason you don't faithfully read your Bible like you ought to is because you've never purposed to do so. The reason that you don't come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night is because you've never purposed to do so. You never purposed to be faithful. You'll never read your Bible faithfully until you purpose to read it faithfully. You're never going to pray faithfully until you purpose in your heart to pray faithfully. You're not going to come back to church Sunday nights and on Wednesday night until you purpose in your heart that you're going to be in church Sunday night and Wednesday night. Until someday, at some point, you sit down in, your, in yourself, say, I'm going to purpose in my heart, Sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, the Pope's Catholic, and I'll be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And you just, you just purpose in your heart that that's what you're going to do. You'll never witness for Christ until you purpose to witness for Christ. You'll never tell somebody else about Jesus Christ until you purpose in your heart, I'm going to tell them about Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, hey, I'm trying to help you this morning like Barnabas was trying to help these new believers and say, have some purpose of heart. I've never seen a, a day in, in my 50-some years of being a Christian where Christians are living without a purpose. It, no, no wonder a fellow writes a book about the purpose-driven life and it sells millions of copies, tens of millions of copies. And that, that boggles my brain, what little I have. It boggles my brain. Why? Because you mean people don't know the purpose of their life? That's unbelievable. There's a purpose. Have you ever purposed to serve God with your life? To live for God with your life? That Jesus Christ has given Himself for me? I want to live the rest of my days, the rest of my life, living for Him? That's a purpose. Cleave to the Lord. Resolve in your heart to draw nigh to God. Resolve in your heart to lean on His Word. Resolve in your heart to pray and assemble with other believers. 
There was a sign on the door of a business. And it said this, gone out of business, didn't know what our business was. That's a sure good way to go out of business, isn't it? There's a lot of Christians that go out of business. You know why? They don't know what their business was. They didn't know the purpose. Billy Sunday said, more men fail through lack of purpose than lack of talent. You know what you find out as you, as you live? Will you be honest with yourself this morning? You do what you purpose to do. Someone put it this way years ago, I never forgot it, that, that I, I do the things that I really want to do. And the things that I pretend to want to do, I make an excuse for. You think about your life and see if that isn't true. And now sometimes when you don't really want to do something, you find yourself fighting yourself about the excuses you're making on why you don't want to do it. Thanks, Dave. I was feeling pretty lonely. (laughs) It's good to know someone else feels like I do. Good. I get done what I purpose to do. Have you ever purposed to live for God? I mean, just as, just as sure as, as you nail down a time when you received Christ as your Savior, and, and you may not know the exact day. Some do. Some know the exact day, the exact hour, and you know what they were wearing and who was there and all that stuff, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But not everybody knows all those details. But just as sure as you have a time when you know you received Christ as your Savior, when you made that decision, just like when, when, when you're born physically into the world, somebody records the fact you were born at this day and this time. Surely you, you ought to have some recollection of the day or the time when you received Christ as your Savior and you know you were born again. There ought to be some definite time when you know, you know what, that, that day, maybe it's July 7th or July 9th, uh, 2017, when you say, you know what, I purposed in my heart to serve God. I purposed in my heart I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. Well, that will settle so many things in your life. It will settle so many other decisions in your life. If you just say, no, that's all been taken care of because I made the decision, I resolved, I purposed in my heart to live for Jesus Christ. So purpose in your heart to live for God. The second thing I want you to purpose in your heart about is found in Daniel chapter 1. Famous verse that many of you will be familiar with. Back in the book of Daniel, Old Testament, Daniel chapter 1. Notice with me verse number 8. The Bible says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Number two, purpose not to defile yourself. Daniel's in a strange land, land of Babylon, 500 some miles away from Jerusalem. Different customs, different foods, different clothing. And it had been easy for him to cave in. You know why? Most of the other, uh, all the other Hebrews caved in. All the other young men taken captive like he was, They all caved in. They drank whatever Nebuchadnezzar gave them to drink. They ate whatever Nebuchadnezzar gave them to drink, uh, to eat. They, 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 They did whatever, you know, they thought when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. That's what they thought. Daniel did not do that. But why didn't he do it? Because he had purposed in his heart not to do it. Again, we go back to the first point, remember? You do what you purpose in your heart to do. And Daniel purposed that he would not defile himself. And you know what that does? That put Daniel in, listen, the Hebrew boys who got taken captive there, they were ones, as you read earlier in the chapter, they were ones who had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace. These were leaders. These were men who had leadership potential. It was the cream of the crop, so to speak. They're the first group that Babylon's, the Babylonians took captive out of Jerusalem. And Daniel was in that group. And, and listen, they, 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 they all, so they're in a minority in the land of Babylon. But Daniel will be a minority among the minority. 
Now, help me understand, Christians, we are, min- we are minority in the midst of a majority. Majority of unbelievers. But wait, if you defile, if you de- the purpose in your heart not to defile yourself, you'll be in a minority among the minority. You'll be in a minority even among believers, those who claim the name of Christ. And, and you have to be prepared not only to be a minority, uh, some of you have you've adjusted to the fact that you're not like most people in the world. You're not like most people in the United States of America. You're, you're probably like uh, many, many sometimes in, in your own family, extended family that are not believers. You may have get-togethers and you may have family gatherings and you realize, you know what, I'm different. I realize I'm different. I talk differently, I think differently, I look different than they do. I, I'm just different because of what Jesus Christ has done in your life. But wait, when you purpose in your heart not to defile yourself, you, you're going to be different even than those who name the name of Christ. You'll be a minority among the minority. And so you have to purpose in your heart to live holy. Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself with the wickedness or the immorality or the vulgarity of the Babylonians. The, he, he, he had purposed in his heart to set himself apart for God. Have you ever done that? You ever purposed in your heart that you're going to be set apart in your life for God? That you're going to set, that's what, that's what holy means, that's what sanctified means, it means to be set apart. I'm setting myself apart for God. My wife was telling me the other night she had a conversation with Micah. Micah was here for five days. Micah's six years old. And he was telling my wife, and I'm, I, I'm not sure I'll get all this conversation right, but I hope I'll get most of it, at least accurate enough for you to understand what he was saying. Micah's really a sweet boy. He's laying in bed with her, I think, one of the nights and before he goes to sleep, and he says, Grandma, when I... When I have my honey. He gets married. He said, when I get married, have my honey. He called her honey. He says, we're going to, what do you say? We're going to watch a movie and eat popcorn. We're going to have popcorn and watch a movie. And he said, okay. He said, but how do I know who my honey's going to be? And he said, well, he said, God knows that, Micah. God knows who your honey's going to be. He says, but how does God know who my honey's going to be when I don't know who they're going to be? Huh? He said, well, God's preparing somebody just for you. And he's preparing you for somebody else. And you want to be prepared for the person God has for you. And that's exactly what, and that's why, listen, you set yourself apart for the person that God has in the, in the marriage vows. You say, I'm forsaking all others, and unto thee you pledge yourself. What are you doing? You're, you're, you're being sanctified. You're setting yourself apart. Hey, hey, have you ever set yourself apart for God? Have you ever de- made the decision like you, like you did at the marriage altar or what like you did when you said your vows? Yeah, I'm separating myself just for God and not the things of the world. Have you ever purposed in your heart Resolved in your heart to be a clean vessel for God to use? You ever resolved in your heart not to defile yourself with pornography? You ever purpose in your heart not to defile yourself with profanity? You ever purpose in your heart not to defile yourself with the rock music and the rap music of the world? Have you ever purpose in your heart not to defile yourself with the philosophy and the world view of Hollywood? Boy, it's quiet this morning. You ever, you ever de- purpose in your heart not to defile yourself with the filth of television and movies? You find yourself battling sometimes because you're battling. You're, you're double-minded in all your ways, see, because you're, you're, you've let so much of the world influence you. And now you battle with what you know the Bible says, and you find yourself saying, well, I know the Bible says this, but... And then you want to say some of the world's philosophy. And you're struggling. And the answer to that struggle is, 
Purpose in your heart to be set apart to God. Purpose in your heart that I'll not defile myself with that. If that's a problem for you, hey, listen. Can you, can you go without your television for a whole day? You say, oh man, a whole day without TV? Wait a minute. If you can't go without a drink of alcohol for a whole day, what are you? You're an alcoholic. If you can't go without a cigarette for a whole day, what are you? Yeah, you're, you're addicted to tobacco. Well, if I can't go with television for a whole day, what am I? Huh? I'm addicted to television. Why don't you go, if you can go a day, why can't you go a week? Some of you in a week, you'd have withdrawal system, symptoms. <laughs> we'd, we'd come visit you, you'd be curled up in a little ball in the corner of your house. How sad would that be? But that shows what a grip it gets on you. Purpose. How did Daniel get that way? He purposed that. That's how. He prayed three times a day. I'll tell you how he did that. He purposed to do that. He purposed to do that. He could interpret dreams. Listen, the fact he could pray three times a day and interpret dreams and the fact that the Bible says there in Daniel he had an excellent spirit. That's his attitude. Even that wasn't that, that was the, the opinion of the people who he worked with, the people who really didn't even like him. But they had to admit he had a good spirit about him. How did all that start? He got promoted in the kingdom. How did all that happen? It all happened because of chapter 1 and verse 8 and probably before that verse that he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. That he purposed in his heart to be set apart for God. That he would live a holy life. It all started when he purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart to cleave to the Lord. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Let me give you number three. Go to Psalm 17, please. The 17th Psalm. Are you okay this morning? Good, because you're not going to be here in a minute. Psalm 17. <laughs> you, think, you think you had our time with those? Sit tight. Psalm 17. Notice Psalm 17 and verse 3 with me, please. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me, and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. You ever purposed that your mouth wouldn't transgress? Have you ever, the Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So what does it mean to have corrupt communication? That which is not edifying is corrupt. God says the opposite of you being corrupt is you're letting words come out of your mouth that are not building up. They're tearing down. You know why many people have never, ever gained control of their tongue is they've never purposed in their heart not to transgress with their tongue. James chapter 3 tells us that the mark or the measure of a mature Christian is their ability to control the tongue. That's why David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. David said, I going to need you to guard my heart because it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. There's an unkind tongue. There's a cutting tongue. There's a vile tongue. There's a cursing tongue. There's a degrading tongue. There's a gossiping tongue. And all because you never purposed not to transgress with your tongue.
let no corrupt communication. <laughs> well, Pastor, I can just tell you something right now. I can't do that. Have you ever purposed not to? You ever purposed not to? The Bible fill, is filled with condemnation of people that would slander other people. That would bring reproach upon other people. Bob Jones Sr. said it's just as bad to carry a rumor around after it starts as it is to start it. No. I'm not saying this is true, but this is what I heard. I don't know if this is true or not, but here's something to pray about. That's our Christian way of gossiping. And saying things that are not edifying to anybody, but only tearing down and casting reproach. There's a rabbi, Joseph, Joseph Telushkin. He's lectured around the country and on the, on the impact of words. And he asked, we'll go along these same lines, this is probably where I got that thought earlier, but he, he asked audiences if they can go 24 hours without saying any unkind words about or to anybody. Can you go 24 hours without saying unkind word about or to anybody. He said, invariably, a minority of listeners raise their hands and say yes. Some laugh, and quite a large number will call out no. And he says, those who can't answer yes must recognize you have a serious problem. In fact, if you cannot go 24 hours without saying unkind words about others, you've lost control over your tongue. He encourages people to do this. Monitor your conversation for two days. Write on a piece of paper every time you say something negative about somebody who isn't present. Record when others do so as well. And what your reaction is when that happens. Do you try to silence the speaker? Or do you ask for more details? And he said again, he said to ensure the test accuracy, don't make an effort to change the content of your conversation for two days. Don't try to be kinder than usual in assessing someone else's character actions. But he said most people who take the test are unpleasantly surprised. James says the tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's set on fire and he says it's set on fire of hell. There's nothing in you or me that can destroy others and destroy the work of God faster than our tongues. When you have an addiction, the biggest the first step in getting help for your addiction, the very first thing you have to do is admit what? Admit I've got a problem. The first step to ever getting control of your tongue is to admit I've got a problem. I have a tool of Satan in my mouth. Layman Strauss said to be 
James 3 is a key to the solution of most of the ills in the Christian life and in church life today. It's, I would probably add to that, it's not only Christian life and church life, but home life as well. It's forest fire season. Heard the other day in the news how many three major fires raging out west, consuming acres and acres of land. But there's many homes that have been destroyed. There's many churches that have been destroyed. There's many Christian lives that have been destroyed because of a fire that was started by somebody's tongue. Ask God often to tame your tongue. And sometimes we, we can, we're, we're so, it's so easy to do. I mean, it's so easy to, I can say, Boy, Brother, uh, Brother Wright, that's a nice suit you have on. Sure better than one you had on last week. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Why couldn't I have just said that sure is a nice suit you have on? Why did I have to add the second comma? Hmm? Where, what, what purpose did that serve? You understand? so easy to be negative. It's easy to say things that don't need to be said. You'd be amazed how, how, much, how much happier you'll be. How much better off you'll be if you purpose not to transgress with your mouth. Purpose in your heart to cleave to the Lord. Purpose in your heart not to defile yourself. Purpose in your heart to speak right. To speak good things. If it's not, if it's not helpful, if it's not putting somebody in a good light, don't say it. Don't say it. Leave it alone. Encourage somebody and don't add in the zinger. Okay? Is it necessary? Boy, your hair looks real nice today, Heather Joy. Much better than last week. <laughs> See? Why would I say that? Just your hair looks nice today. And she says, thank you. Hmm? Oh, that we could learn that. You ready to move on? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter nine, please. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yeah. We're purposing in our heart to cleave to the Lord. We're serve God. The purpose in our heart not to defile ourselves, but to be set apart to God. Purposing in our heart not to transgress with our mouth, but to speak right. We're purposing in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. The Bible says here, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him what? Give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Purpose to give. You know why most people never cheerfully, as that verse says, give to the Lord? Never purpose to do so. You know why some people struggle with giving? Because they never purposed that they're going to give. You have to purpose that that's what you're going to do. When you, when you make the purchase of uh, an automobile or you make the purchase of your home, even if it's a rental agreement, what are you doing? You're purposing in your heart that you're going to make the payment. Are you not? I'll say, when you're purchasing something like that, if you have to make a payment, if you're going to buy a home and, and says, okay, well, you, you know, you're approved for this loan, now your payment is going to be, you know, $800 a month. You say, well, I'll do the best I can, but I'm not sure I can handle that. 
Those are really not words the banker wants to hear. Am I right? Doesn't exude much confidence, does it? No. You before you ever have those, if you ever make that kind of agreement, you know, dude, there's a discussion that goes on about what can we afford and what we're going to purpose that this is the amount and this is the amount we'll pay every month. And we're purposing in our heart, we're going to do this. And you have to purpose in your heart, that's what you're going to do. You purpose in your heart what you're going to give to God. Do you purpose to give to the Lord in the same way? Someone said you give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. You know, you, you think, think about what you give. And I have no idea what people give. I don't look at the giving records. I don't, I don't want to. So I have no idea who gives and who doesn't give or who gives what or how much. I don't know. But take what you give over a month's time, or over a year's time, multiply it by 10 and see if you could live on that. Say, well, I give. Let's say I give. Preacher, I give, you know, $25 every week. Okay, that's $100 a month. That's $1,000. Uh, $100 a month, $1,200 a year. $12,000. Would you live on $12,000 a year? Hmm? Well, not very well. If your house payment's $800, you're going to have a hard time. If your house payment was $600, you'd have a hard time on $1,200 a month. Hmm? Multiply what, what the Lord... And, and, and you think, well, I couldn't survive on that. Well, how do you expect the work of God to survive on that? If you couldn't thrive on that, how does God's work thrive on that? The average church member contributes between 1.5 and 2.5% of their income specifically to the Lord's work. That's church membership across the board in the United States. Is there any wonder there's so many unreached people groups? We've been putting them on the prayer list now for three years and we're just over a third of the way through. How many, how many at a time? Ten at a time. Because we'll never reach the world or get the job done on spare change. We'll never accomplish what God desires us to accomplish until His people purpose in their heart to give. You go to, and, and I haven't been to either of these places for a long time, but, but I know that if you went up to Cedar Point today or if you went down to Kings Island today, the places will be packed at 50-some bucks for a ticket. And people won't bat an eye to fork it out. Go to the baseball stadiums or the football stadiums during football season and the places are packed out and it's, it's 50 and 100 and up for tickets. And they're full of people. Why? Because somebody purposed in their heart, that's what I'll spend my money on. Where's God's people to say, I'm purposing my heart to give to God's work and to get the gospel to the world? We'll never reach the world on spare change. Purpose to give to the work of God. When Mary took that alabaster box of that expensive ointment, and, and which, which was probably about a year's wage, and when she was criticized for it, that she broke that and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped it with her tears and with the ointment and, and anointed his body really for the burial. Of course, criticized about why was this waste. They had people criticized saying, you're wasting your money. No, nothing you give for Jesus Christ is ever wasted, my friend. 
That's the best place in the world, the best place in all the universe to invest it. It's in the work of God. And the only way she could do that is she had the purpose she was going to do it. I don't think that was it. Do you really think it was a last minute thing and she's walking out of her house, she's saying, let's see, what can I grab? Oh, this will work. Oh, I don't think so. I think she knew Jesus was coming. And I think she planned. I think she purposed in her heart that she was going to give that. That was valuable. It's expensive. We're still talking about it 2,000 years later. <laughs> what I'm saying this morning is you'll never be a good Christian till you purpose to be one. you never be faithful till you purpose to be faithful. You're never, you're never going to have a good marriage till you purpose to have a good marriage. You're never going to be a good son or a good daughter till you purpose to have, be a good son or a good daughter. You're never going to purpose, purpose, purpose. Whether it's a wife, whether it's a husband, whether it's a Christian, you'll never accomplish what you desire, what you should until you purpose that you're going to do it. Purpose of heart. Purpose of heart. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, that what you purpose, you do. And I pray, Lord, that in this area, we could be like you. That what we purpose, we will do. I'm asking you this morning, Lord, that if any of you here have never received Christ as their Savior, that they would purpose in their heart that today's the day they get saved. Maybe some are here this morning and they've saved, but they've never been baptized, and they need to purpose in their heart that I need to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe they're saved and baptized, and they've got a purpose in their heart. They ought to belong to a church and serve in a local body of believers. And they purpose in their heart to do so. I pray that many in the room today who are saved and are members of this church would purpose in their heart to cleave to the Lord, to be glued to, to the Lord, to serve Him with their life, not to defile themselves with the things of this world, but set themselves apart to God, that we would be purposed with purpose of heart, not transgress with our tongue. Guard what we say, that the words of our mouth would be acceptable in thy sight. And that we would purpose in our heart to give to the work of God. Purpose of heart. Speak to hearts, Lord. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, there was a time in my life when I knew I was lost and I needed to be saved. And I, someone told me about Jesus and shared with me the, the gospel, the plan of salvation, what Jesus did for me. And I called on the Lord Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. Pastor, this morning I, I know I have eternal life because I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up for a moment and say, Pastor, that's me. Here's my hand as a testimony. God bless you. You may put them down. Is there somebody here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever had a time when I put my faith in Jesus alone as my Savior. And Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about that. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? Okay, thank you. The message was mainly to believers in today. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Pastor, the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart this morning about purpose in my heart, resolving in my heart to live for God, not to defile myself with the things of this world, but set myself apart for God, not to transgress with my tongue and to give generously, cheerfully to the work of God. 
I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart this morning. Please pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart this morning. I want you to respond to him. The altar is open. You come and bow the knee to the Lord. Talk to him. Do business with him before you leave this morning. He's spoken to you. Now you speak to him. If you're here and you've never received Christ, if you're here and you're saved and you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, if you're saved and you're baptized and you want to belong to Bible Baptist Church, whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, respond to him this morning. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. I pray your will will be done now in these next few moments of invitation. That each one will do exactly what you're bidding them to do in their heart. May your will be done. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation hymn. You respond. Will you please? Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, this morning. Appreciate that. Getting a name for you up front here, and we'll be ready to go. Don't forget tonight, 5.30, for the soul winning witnessing class in the conference room. 6.30 tonight, back here for the evening service. All right? Look forward to a good service together this evening. All right? Ready? Well, we're glad to have Kimberly Burns coming this morning. 
Uh, Kim is saved and baptized. Of course, she's been up at North Love Baptist in Rockford for the last 11 months, and now she's back home. And uh, we're delighted she's here, and she's coming to be a member of the church and uh, ready to jump in and serve. And uh, we're so delighted that she's here and uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in you and through you as you serve the Lord here at Bible Baptist Church. And uh, all those in favor of welcoming Kimberly into the fellowship of our church, let it be known by hearty eye Aye. and opposed by like sign. Amen. That's good. When we go back, if you would escort her back there so folks can greet her on the way out, that would be wonderful. And uh, it's exciting, exciting days ahead. That's great. And uh, we praise the Lord for Kim. All right. Let's stand together. We'll have our prayer and then we'll sing our song. I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God. And we look forward to seeing everybody back here this evening. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I pray that Many will be back tonight because we purpose in our heart to be back on Sunday night. Lord, I pray that each of us would search our heart and say, God, you search my heart and help me to have purpose of heart. That I would not just wander through life, but I would with purpose live for Christ with my life. And so, Lord, help us to do what we purpose to do so we can be like you. We love you. We pray for a good afternoon and bring us back for the services this evening. Thank you for Kim and for bringing her back here to our church. And Lord, we're excited about what you're going to do with her for the future. I pray we'll be a blessing and encouragement to her. And I know that she will be to us. Show her exactly what you'd have her to do. And Lord, what uh, her purpose would be here. And Lord, I pray that she'll influence many for the kingdom of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.